with China on Book Notes. American Perspectives begins with columnist William F. Buckley and former Senator George McGovern debating the merits of conservatism versus liberalism. This discussion was held at Southeast Missouri State University last month and lasts an hour and a half. The theme of this inaugural week is Creating Tomorrow. And this morning we will explore that theme in the form of a debate on the topic of the future of conservative and liberal ideology, which is the best guide into the 21st century. This seems an appropriate debate topic for us, so close here to the Mississippi River, with its many tributaries, and a river so prominent in our history, including a key phrase in the university alma mater. Perhaps we should think about the early explorers of America's rivers and try to imagine what it must have been like for them as they moved against the current, pausing frequently to determine if they should follow the right or the left tributary. The great explorers, Lewis and Clark, who met in Louisville, Kentucky, to launch their great expedition to the West, may, in fact, have stopped near present-day Cape Girardeau to consider their future course. On this significant day in the history of Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau, let us pause to consider directions as we seek to create the course to tomorrow. If we are fortunate uh, in that uh, this morning we have with us two of the most well-known explorers of conservative and liberal ideology in the nation. Senator George McGovern has for the past quarter century been identified with liberal causes and new directions in American politics. A two-term member of the House of Representatives and a U.S. Senator for 18 years. Senator McGovern was the 1972 Democratic presidential nominee. Mr. McGovern grew up in a small town in South Dakota where his father was a Methodist minister. World War II broadened his horizons beyond the prairies as he served as a pilot of the Dakota Queen, a B-24 bomber in which he flew 35 missions and for which he earned the Distinguished Flying Cross. He returned home after the war and did graduate work in American history, earning a PhD at Northwestern University, and returned to South Dakota to become a college history professor. In 1962, he was elected to the U.S. Senate, where he became one of the first members of the U.S. Congress to openly oppose American participation in the Vietnam War. Mr. McGovern served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee throughout the 1970s and was appointed by both Presidents Carter and Ford as a United Nations delegate. In 1982, he founded Americans for Common Sense, providing an alternative political voice on behalf of minorities, the poor, and other marginalized Americans. Senator McGovern is the author of four books, Agricultural Thought in the 20th Century, a Time of War, A Time of Peace, his autobiography, Grass Roots, and more recently, Terry, a deeply moving chronicle of his third child's efforts to overcome her addiction to alcohol. Senator McGovern has previously been on our campus, and I would like for you to join with me and welcome him back to Southeast Missouri State University. William F. Buckley is a nationally prominent author, columnist, politician, editor, adventurer, philosopher, lecturer, and television personality. And the list goes on. In 1955, Mr. Buckley founded the conservative journal National Review, which is today the journal of opinion with the largest circulation in America. In 1962, he began his syndicated column on the right. Today it appears twice a week in over 300 newspapers here and abroad. In 1966, Mr. Buckley began hosting his weekly television show, Firing Line, 
which is now the longest running television program in the United States with the same host. Virtually every political and intellectual leader throughout the world has been a guest on the show. He's won an Emmy Award for Program Achievement and the TV Guide Award for the Best Television Interviewer in America. As an author, his diversity holds no bounds. Mr. Buckley is philosophical in God and Man at Yale, Up from Liberalism, and Right Reason. He is autobiographical in Overdrive and The Unmaking of a Mirror. He has written a great number of fictional works, plays, and even children's books. William F. Buckley was born in New York City, graduated with honors from Yale, and has been awarded over 35 honorary degrees. In 1991, he was the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Please welcome to our campus for the first time, Mr. William F. Buckley. Procedures for the debate will be as follows. Mr. Buckley will lead off with 15 minutes allotted for him to outline his views on the question of which is the best guidance for the 21st century, conservative or liberal ideology. Mr. McGovern will then follow with uh, uh, 15 minutes to rebut uh, Mr. Buckley and then deliver uh, his own thoughts uh, on the topic. Uh, Mr. Buckley will then have five minutes to uh, rebut uh, Mr. McGovern. And following these comments from our two distinguished visitors, we will have questions from a panel consisting of two students, two faculty members, and two members from the Cape Girardeau community. These individuals I'd like to introduce now are Neil E. Boyd, Vice President of Student Government uh, here at Southeast. Ms. Christy Johnson, a student representative also to the Southeast Board of Regents. Uh, Mr. Howard Meagle, uh, who is the general manager of KFVS Television in Cape Girardeau. Ms. Ann Poston, Human Resources of the Dana Corporation. And Dr. Alberta Dugan, Chairman of the Department of History at Southeast. And Dr. Peter Bergeson, Chairman of the Department of Political Science here. Following questions from the panel, Mr. Buckley and Mr. McGovern will have approximately three to five minutes to make their closing remarks. We're very pleased to have here this morning C-SPAN with us to film to today's program. And we look forward to the opportunity to view our session on their American Perspectives uh, program. And now, if we can uh, initiate our debate, I would like to introduce to you Mr. William F. Buckley. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> members, <clears throat> members of the panel, Mr. Chairman, Senator McGovern. <clears throat> uh, I'm very happy to be here and to participate in the uh, <clears throat> august events of the, of the day. I thank you all for the hospitality extended thus far. <clears throat> It is true that um, yesterday, driving in, Senator McGovern expressed his disappointment that he was not being asked to read his poetry at the inauguration. <clears throat> <clears throat> I told him what he would be doing during debate is reciting political poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Fun to listen to, but not anything to be guided by. <clears throat> Uh, Senator McGovern has had a distinguished uh, uh, history, and uh, the American century is very beholden to him, especially beholden to him for not having been elected. <laughs> <laughs> We've been asked to uh, suggest, suggest guidance uh, into the 21st century, <clears throat> and to ask whether in the course of the 20th century we have been primarily armed 
by developments that um, tend us in conservative positions or tend us in liberal positions, I think it important to reflect in foreign policy that it has been a very sad century. We've had great uh, climactic uh, victories, but at a very high cost. I was 18 years old when the bomb at Hiroshima went off, and I was a senior citizen when the Berlin Wall came down. The interval was called, called the, the Cold War. It's quite true that we won the Cold War, but it's also true that an entire generation began young and ended old before that war was won. That was substantially the result of our failure to do the right thing at the right time. The uh, object of statecraft is to abort crisis. It can be said that we aborted crises in the sense that we did not end uh, the century in a great nuclear blast that consumed the planet can't be said that we won the Cold War in the sense of relieving millions upon millions upon millions of people of the terrible lives that their entire, that, would take, that took up their entire lifetimes. These were opportunities uh, uh, missed and opportunities that continue to be missed. And we're entitled to ask, uh, are there guidelines that distinguish conservative statecraft from the state, statecraft commonly thought of as, as liberal. Uh, paradoxically enough, Mr. McGovern is not in the hard liberal tradition uh, of his uh, own party. The notion that we can and must be responsible for spreading democracy everywhere was most emphatically popularized in this century by Woodrow Wilson, as we all know, and re-emphasized by John F. Kennedy in his uh, inaugural uh, uh, address. Back in uh, 19, back in 1824, an appetite developed in America to intervene in the War of Austrian Succession. It was on that occasion that uh, President John Adams gave his celebrated speech on the 4th of July, in which he said, American people are friends of liberty everywhere, but custodians only of their own. That uh, foresight tempered the uh, expansive suggestion that we should send uh, the Marines to every corner of the world uh, in which practices were not identical to uh, our own. We had a, a sense of the limitations of power, uh, which sense uh, we uh, exercised, attempting to make irrelevant uh, distinctions. This was highlighted when we sent the Marines in 1965 to land in the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic occupies the eastern half of a single island of Hispaniola. On the right, on the eastern half where we did land the Marines, a threat was acknowledged of a Soviet salient, similar to Cuba's. Uh, in anticipation of such an effort, we did land the Marines there and we tended to reorient the situation uh, away from that possibility as 10 years later we did in Grenada. On the western half of the same island, the reigned uh, Papa Doc, one of the singular sadists of this century, for which there is much competition. We ignored him, substantially ignored him, because he wasn't a part of an apparatus that sought uh, the destruction of liberty everywhere. That was a kind of a geopolitical distinction, uh, uh, very satisfactory to uh, conservative reconnaissance, and one which uh, I uh, would urge on you to pass along to the 21st century after I am no longer there to counsel it. These are distinctions that I, uh, I uh, urge on uh, the country, and these are in very sharp departure from the consistent calls for disarmament that have characterized uh, Senator McGovern's public uh, career. At one point, when John F. Kennedy was the president, he called for one uh, disarmament uh, drive uh, which was rejected by the Senate 
by a vote of 76 to 2, uh, isolating George McGovern as a policymaker, where in my judgment he belongs to be isolated. Uh, Ms. Mr. McGovern, uh, in his lust for peace, found himself backing Henry Wallace, a Soviet stooge, in 1948. Uh, uh, and now, Mr. McGovern is identified with that inscrutable uh, movement that says that we should not spend uh, money to develop an anti-missile uh, missile. Uh, this, uh, this refusal to exploit our own technological resources, given the fact that we live in an age in which uh, uh, more and more countries uh, have uh, the nuclear, uh, have, have chemical and uh, nuclear and biological means of spreading massive destruction is uh, an economy that is, uh, uh, that is uh, 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 very difficult uh, to understand. So we want, we want a combination of uh, a provident use of American resources together with a convincing and emphatic power to have our way when, when as custodians of the balance of freedom in the world, uh, our efforts become critical. Unhappily, Senator McGovern also has views on domestic policy. <laughs> Those views on domestic policy uh, can be summarized by his enthusiasm for turning problems on over to the shoulders of the state. It's remarkable uh, how how uh, reluctant we are to learn about the uh, impoverishment of uh, handing over social ideals to uh, to the government. It was uh, uh, it was James, Mad James um, uh, no, it was Jefferson who said the government can only do something for you in proportion as it can do something to you, uh, and it was uh, and it was uh, Adams who said the government turns every contingency into an excuse for amassing greater power in its own hands. Woodrow Wilson uh, said the history of liberalism is the history of man's efforts to restrain the growth of government. But have we done anything of the sort? There was a great debate on the welfare bill last uh, year, you may remember. Uh, Senator Kennedy, during that debate, uh, uh, asked had we forgotten what we have accomplished with uh, welfare programs. Uh, what, well, what have we, in fact, uh, accomplished uh, with them? Since 1960, uh, we spent $2.6 trillion on, on welfare. Things are here and there a little better, and things are here a little bit worse, and th things here and there are really quite a lot uh, worse. Since 1960, there's been a 560% increase in violent crime, more than a 400% increase in illegitimate births a quadrupling of divorce rates, a tripling of the percentage of children living in single-parent homes, and a drop of 80 points in SAT. Manifestly, there has been a correlation between federal disbursements and the general welfare, but it has been a negative uh, correlation. Let's advise the 21st century to abide by the principle of subsidiarity. The principle of subsidiarity says, if there is a problem, Turn it over to the private sector to cope with. If manifestly it can't cope with it, then turn it over to government. But always seek out the lowest echelon of government, not the higher echelon of government. It is the tendency of liberalism instantly to be attracted by total power. The federal government, the power above all to tax, uh, and the power to uh, pass regulations and to pass laws. Uh, the failure of the federal government to solve the poverty program is wonderfully manifested by the stark figures. In the year 1900, 90% of the American people were poor by current standards of poverty. That figure diminished to 11, 12, 13% 30 years ago, and it has not moved substantially from there. Uh, surely one of the reasons why it has not moved is because there have been so many inhibitions on the kind of American ingenuity and the American resources and the Americans' passion to solve and to attack social problems using those resources. I, I urge you, therefore, to pass along to the 21st century the wonderful intuition of Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher, 
He said, you know, you learn much more in the study of history about any situation, about any uh, era, by examining what it is that people aren't saying. What they aren't saying is what they take for granted. What we are ceasing increasingly to say in America is the extent to which there is a correlation between how much money is spent by the public sector over against how much money is spent by the private sector. Spending by the private sector is money spent in the exercise of individual freedom. The moment it is taken by the public sector, it is transmuted into uh, uh, an anonymous uh, uh, collectivity which seeks to affect goals that appeal to foreign legislators sitting in Washington and squandering our resources. Uh, if you want to interrupt me with a burst of applause, I will understand your brother. In any event, I invite uh, Senator McGovern to uh, rewrite uh, history. He is well equipped academically to do that. And I think that uh, sending him to Washington was a terrible loss to the uh, academy, and we should all grieve for it. Thank you. Senator McGovern will now make his statement of philosophy looking into the 21st century. Echo members of the panel, my friend William Buckley. Let me um, say, first of all, that I'm pleased to be on this campus of Southeast uh, Missouri State University, and especially in view of a longtime friendship I have had with your president, uh, Dale Nitschke. It's been my privilege uh, since leaving the Senate some 16 years ago to be on campuses all across this country. And I know of no president that I rate uh, above Dale Nitschke. I think you're very fortunate to uh, have him. Uh, as um, Professor um, Mitch, uh, My Michael has uh, told us, um, William Buckley is a very distinguished uh, novelist. It's been my, uh, been my, <laughs> it's been my uh, privilege and my gain to read most of those novels, and I commend all of them. They're very well done, and will hold your uh, attention. The chairman has also reminded you that I'm a historian. So Mr. Buckley and I have reached an agreement uh, about this debate today. As a novelist, he will give you nothing but fiction. Uh, and uh, you've already had a sample of that. And uh, as a historian, I will give you nothing but the truth uh, today. I'm going to save most of my uh, rebuttal until the time for the rebuttal in the debate. I'm supposed to give my constructive speech on liberalism at this point, but let me just say I have uh, noted uh, my uh, esteemed sparring uh, partner, Mr. Buckley, uh, has this morning, as he has in other debates, uh, quoted with some approval uh, such liberal Democrats as Woodrow Wilson and John Kennedy. On other occasions, he's even quoted Harry Truman and Franklin Roosevelt. But what I've noted about all of these cases uh, is that in addition to being very distinguished liberals, they're also all now dead. Uh, and I, uh, I once uh, said to uh, Bill, if I uh, promise to die uh, before you do, <laughs> Uh, will you say a few good things about me? Uh, he was noncommittal. Uh, I just want to make one comment at the outset here about my position on uh, disarmament, which has been referred to here today, and also mention that 
I had uh, once supported the former Vice President of the United States, former Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Henry Wallace. When World War II came along, Pearl Harbor, I was a sophomore at Dakota Wesleyan University. I was 19 years of age, and I volunteered within three months to serve as a bomber pilot in that war. What I discovered is that there were no instructors trained. There were no airplanes available for training purposes. When I say no, I mean grossly inadequate. Even not enough uh, training fails. I had to wait for a year before they could take us into service because of that lack of preparedness. I never again want to see the United States in that position. I have always been without fail for a strong national defense for the United States. This has been a dangerous world all of my life, and I've always supported a strong national defense. But that did not include backing the policymakers who thought it was in the interest of our defense and security to send our young men to Vietnam. Even the architects. Uh, even the architects of that mistaken policy now know that it was a dreadful mistake. If you don't believe that, take the time to read Robert McNamara's me memoir, one of the chief architects and most consistent advocates of our uh, involvement there. Those of us who criticized American policy there are sometimes branded as weak on defense. Those of us who criticize unnecessary and wasteful military spending that we know something about based on our own service are also sometimes criticized as weak on national defense. Those critics were led by the one five-star general we've had in the White House, President Eisenhower, who warned in his farewell address that a major problem before this country was the mounting power of the military-industrial complex and its capacity to get its way at times when it went beyond the real defense and security requirements of the country. So I don't need a lecture on weakness or on national uh, defense, but I do want to make clear that one of the challenges to both liberals and conservatives is to, as we move into this next century, is to recognize that the Cold War has ended. We've built up a massive military structure around the world that was designed to fight a war simultaneously against the Soviet Union and communist China. Now the Soviet Union is gone, and China has become our most favored nation trading partner. So we need to look at this massive uh, spending for military purposes and ask ourselves whether we need all of that money to continue going in that direction or whether some of it should be diverted to rebuilding other sources of national strength, such as our roadways, our bridges, our tunnels, our water and sewage systems, and other things that this country needs that also contribute to national defense and national security. And that, one of the reasons I support the liberal uh, tradition, although frequently some of my fellow liberals have not stood up on this issue as well as I wish they had, is that I think we have a better chance of leading this country into a balanced view of how we allocate our resources in the uh, 21st uh, century. Let me just add one further thing. Um, I never once, in all of those 10 years of trying to stop our involvement in Vietnam, ever criticized one American soldier. Those soldiers had my full uh, sympathy and understanding and support. And they still do. I can't look at that wall, the Vietnam Wall in Washington with those 58,000 names uh, without a sense of real grief. I mourn the passing of every one of those boys. But it was the policymakers who needed to be uh, challenged. And that's what we're talking about here today. Now, the question that uh, 
that Mr. Buckley and I were originally given was the future of conservative and liberal ide ideology, will they survive into the 21st uh, century? I, uh, I take the view that I uh, earnestly hope both of these time-tested political traditions will survive into the 20th century. I want to see both uh, William F. Buckley and George McGovern make it into the uh, 21st uh, century. And, uh, uh, and I hope that the uh, traditions, the rival traditions that we represent will continue uh, to flourish because it's been my conviction for a long time that it is the, the creative tension and the, uh, the competition, if you will, of ideas uh, between conservatism on one hand and liberalism on the other that is the real genius of American politics. This is the source of much of our strength, and it's the reason that uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, one a liberal, one a conservative, went to their graves admiring each other uh, with affection and approval despite their competing uh, views. Um, I want, uh, uh, as I say, the conservative tradition to be heard, and I, I want uh, uh, Bill Buckley to continue to be heard, but I don't want him to go unchallenged uh, any more than I think that liberalism and George McGovern should go uh, unchallenged. My mother and father, we're lifelong conservatives, lifelong Republicans, religious fundamentalists. I was too until World War II uh, came along and I traveled around the, uh, the world for a while and then came back to Northwestern University and under the GI Bill of Rights, one of these awful federal programs that Mr. Buckley thinks concentrates too much power, uh, in the hands of the federal government. Uh, under that program, I and several million other Americans were educated. That program cost billions of dollars, but we're told that having educated a whole generation of young Americans, it more than paid for itself. The federal government actually made money on it. The taxpayers made money on it. Why? Because those young men and some women were able to increase their earning power to the point where they more than paid back the cost of that investment. And they lifted the quality of American society uh, from that day to this. It's a marvelous, marvelous example of what a liberal program originally opposed by conservatives can do uh, to move this uh, country uh, forward. Even prior to that, I saw the record of liberalism as a high school a student growing up out in the Dust Bowl days in, in South Dakota. South Dakota is now underwater, but when I was uh, uh, growing up, it was afflicted with dust storms and drought chronically. Farmers were going broke, the banks had failed, people were out of work. It was a desperate place. I don't recall being particularly poor, I guess, because everybody was poor. Certainly Methodist ministers were poor uh, in those days, and I grew up in a parsonage. But what I saw was a positive series of moves by the federal government. Some of them uh, were clumsy, some of them could have been better, but they did things like bringing electricity to the farms of South Dakota, the REA program. They developed the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Missouri River, and other river systems. They put unemployed people to work in the civilian conservation camps. They provided guaranteed bank deposits so the banks could open again with the confidence of their customers. They provided social security for our grandparents. They provided work uh, for people building courthouses and roadways and shelter belts and all the rest. 
And that was the record of liberalism in the period when I was growing up uh, in South Dakota uh, in a Republican party, uh, in a Republican family. But it began to set my own mind thinking about Franklin Roosevelt and later Harry Truman. And then in the decade that followed World War II, we saw not only things like the GI Bill of Rights, we saw the beginning of civil rights. We saw shortly after that uh, movements to build the interstate highway system. Again, the long arm of the federal government that Mr. Buckley uh, spoke about. And we saw a whole range of other uh, programs, including movements to provide equality for women, the environmental uh, movement, the effort to lift the quality of, of education. This is the liberal agenda. I regret to say that that agenda has sometimes made the most comfortable and most entrenched of our citizens a little nervous. Why? Because you can't do positive things like the GI Bill of Rights and REA and public service jobs when people are unemployed without taxes. It's true, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody has to pay uh, for these things. And there are some people so comfortable in their own resources, they can't understand that there are other needs across this country that do require uh, public expenditure. And so there's been a ceaseless barrage against the whole concept of liberalism over the last 20 years. I regret to say that many of my fellow liberals, instead of standing up to that barrage, have run for cover and have chosen to march under a different banner. I'm still a proud liberal. I believe that this liberal agenda is endorsed by most Americans. I honestly believe that most Americans are liberals, even though many of them are unaware of what the liberal agenda is. If they understood that it embraced Social Security and Medicare and the environmental program and civil rights and the effort to end the war in Vietnam and all of these other things that I've talked about here today, I think most Americans would say that while we need a strong conservative tradition to challenge and check and criticize these liberal initiatives, I think they would also recognize that it is the liberal tradition that has given us most of the forward progress in our society. Let me put it to you this way. I can't think of a single public program now generally endorsed by most Americans all the way from Ronald Reagan to the Reverend Jesse Jackson that did not begin as a liberal initiative over conservative opposition. That doesn't mean conservatives are bad. They need to raise criticisms about some of these government initiatives and how they're run. It does mean that we've had to depend on the liberal impulse for most of the gains we've made in modern times. I think the same will be true in the 21st century when we have other problems that need to be addressed. And I've already mentioned one, the need to accept the post-Cold War period and begin to convert carefully some of the unnecessary arms outlays to the rebuilding of this great country. Thank you so much. Mr. Buckley will now present a five-minute rebuttal. Well, Senator McGovern says he doesn't need a lecture on uh, uh, defense after all the Cold War is over. Uh, in 1967, he, wanted to, he voted against the ABM uh, uh, financing in 1969. He said that negotiating from strength is one of the most damaging and costly cliches of the American vocabulary. In 1970, he wanted to get out of NATO. He wanted to stop the ABM and the MIRV and the AMSA uh, conventions. In 1971, he said about ABM, 
He thought it temporarily, at any event, it should be halted even unilaterally. In 18, 1971, he wanted to cut 50% off the defense budget. That was during the days of, of the Cold War. Uh, these are simply his pacific uh, uh, impulses. They have to do with, um, uh, I think, a, a quite general misunderstanding about how it is that, uh, uh, that things get accomplished. What needed to be accomplished during the Cold War was to win it. In order to win it, we had to have a preponderance of strength. In order to have a preponderance of strength, we had to finance uh, a defense uh, uh, industry. The notion that all of that is happening that we approve of is uh, somehow uh, uh, financed by uh, the wispy creation of, uh, of uh, money somewhere uh, is, of course, the great uh, uh, delusion of modern liberalism. What was it in 1873 that caused the founding of this college? Uh, it was not any act uh, of Washington, D.C., uh, of, of any uh, importance. What was it that caused the huge engine that slowly wiped away uh, poverty for 90% of the American people? It wasn't anything done by Washington. It was things done by people like Edison and, by, and Ford and millions and millions of other uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the whole notion that we should be grateful to the government for good health or for good education uh, uh, belies the central point. If I'm going to school and I'm not paying for it, somebody else is paying for it. Who is that uh, person? If I'm uh, getting medical care and I'm not paying for it, somebody else uh, is paying for it. Uh, the notion of the mysteriously accumulating uh, dollar in Washington, D.C. is the pr principal hallucination fostered by contemporary American liberalism. In fact, as in the case of Missouri, uh, one half of one percent more money is spent from Washington to this state than the other way around. Uh, you are financing your own ventures for all intents uh, and purposes. And money that sends to Washington, go to Washington, comes back here, spends an expensive night out on the town in Washington. And there is an attrition uh, in that uh, dollar that is returned to you. It is necessary uh, in, in exploring the notion of what we learn from one another to engage the idea of progress. The traditional method philosophically and scientifically is uh, thesis, antithesis, but then comes synthesis. Uh, I certainly would expect for the rest of my lifetime to learn from George uh, <coughs> McGovern and indeed from uh, other liberals, but uh, I, I am asking for a rejection of that which we have learned does not work. What is the answer <coughs> to the crowning American problem of the day, which is very simply this, illegitimacy? Uh, for everyone, el every illegitimate child, you have a 600% statistical increase in crime and poverty uh, <coughs> and dope uh, addiction. What is it that liberalism tells us about illegitimacy? O o only that we can't pray in schools. I think, no, I think that's the most creative thing that they've ever come up with on this particular subject. So that liberalism refuses to accost uh, genuine reality, preferring instead simply to cite uh, free electricity in South Dakota 50 years uh, ago. It wasn't free electricity. Somebody had to pay for it. <clears throat> I'm delighted they had electricity there. Though maybe if George McGovern as a child had read one fewer books, he might have uh, enlightened us more. Senator McGovern will now have five minutes for his rebuttal. Let me just uh, pick up again on this point on the uh, votes on the arms uh, budget because I think that is important. Every American wants this country to be adequately defended. Uh, no one is advocating that we strip our defenses to the point where we're unable to protect American security. It's true, uh, some of these items that, um, that my friend Mr. Buckley has mentioned uh, did have me in opposition. I was opposed to the ABM. We find that's the uh, anti-ballistic uh, missile system as, as it stood then. It was widely assailed 
by some of the best defense uh, experts in the country as a mistake, we finally agreed to build one of them in North Dakota. If you want to see the biggest white elephant in the American defense arsenal sometime when you're in North Dakota, ask to visit the ABM, which is up there collecting dust and moss, which provides nothing in the way of real uh, defense for this country, but which cost us six billion dollars for that uh, failed uh, experiment. I have always believed that the best way to defend ourselves against nuclear attack is the route that most of our presidents have taken, which is to negotiate arms reduction agreements with the former Soviet Union rather than starting a second arms race as to who can build the greatest defensive system against the other's, mi other's missiles. All that does is to trigger the other country and to increase their offensive missiles. You never win on that uh, proposition, and I think uh, we've finally come to discover that. I might add that uh, if you had to identify the principal causes for the collapse of the Soviet Union, why this system fell, in addition to the fact that uh, Soviet communism was simply a lousy system, uh, it was made even lousier by the fact that the Russians were spending so much of their resources in this arms race with the United States. Tens of thousands of strategic weapons of all kinds that they'd now love to find some way to get rid of. And I do not want to see the United States go that route. We're a much wealthier country. We can afford an arms race like that better than the uh, Soviets. And that's one of the reasons why they went down and we uh, triumph. But we don't need to automatically continue this arms accumulation into the future at a time when no really significant military power is challenging us anywhere in the world. We defeated the Iraqi army in a few days with the commitment of 17 percent of our armed, force, armed forces. Just now it's hard to see anybody else that presents any greater uh, threat to the United States. So I think we need to keep those things in, common, in mind. Uh, with regard to uh, George McGovern having cast uh, a vote at one time to reduce the military budget. Incidentally, the amount I was proposing was a 2% reduction in military outlays at a time when the defense budget was $100 billion. Uh, it's true that vote came out 76 to 2. That doesn't necessarily mean that two people were wrong and 76 were right. It could be the other way around. Did you ever think of that? On the Gulf of Tonkin resolution in 1964 that President Johnson presented to the Senate, in effect giving him a blank check to escalate the war uh, in Vietnam, I went along with that resolution. So did 98 senators. The vote was 98 to 2 in support of that resolution. Only Senator Morris of Oregon and Senator Greening of Alaska had the wisdom and the courage to stand up against it. They were right. The other 98 of us were wrong on that vote. I'm not embarrassed about the votes in the Senate where I stood alone or with two or three other people. The ones that embarrass me are the ones where I sometimes went along with the crowd when I should have stood uh, firm. So, and with, with regard to uh, Mr. Buckley's other central argument here that these domestic programs that I talk about are fine, but they uh, cost money and they run up debts and deficits, I simply want to say this. I suppose if I were to pull out Mr. Uh, Buckley's heroes uh, politically, uh, they would not really be Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt or John Kennedy or Harry Truman. They'd more likely be Ronald Reagan. You know what happened to federal spending and deficit financing and the national debt during those eight Reagan years? 
it tripled the national debt. The biggest annual deficits in our 200-year history, the biggest national debt. I recognize the Congress went along with that, and it was a Democratic Congress much of that time. They could have blocked that, but even if they had accepted the Reagan budget just the way it was submitted every year, that budget that was being offered would have tripled the national debt, as indeed uh, it did. I'm not for that kind of reckless deficit spending. And I think that uh, very few Americans, if they stop to think about it, uh, are. So I don't want to transfer so many obligations to the federal government that we have to run deficits and debts at that level. I do believe in fiscal integrity. And I think that's a mark of a responsible liberal. We will now turn to our panel for questions, beginning with Mr. Neil Boyd. Uh, Mr. Boyd is a, a speech communication major from Sykeston, uh, Missouri, and vice president of student government. Mr. Boyd. Uh, again, I would like to say thank you for coming, Mr. Buckley, Senator McGovern. Being a student uh, involved in politics and at an age where my own political ideology is being shaped by researching candidates' issues and listening to various amounts of uh, political rhetoric, my question is, at what point in your own lives did you begin developing your conservative and, liber and liberal beliefs and what role do you see for politically active youth in shaping or reforming modern political thought for generations to come? <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, I, 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 ne I never was a <clears throat> liberal. <laughs> I guess I just um, should acknowledge <coughs> Grace as um, the lucky provider in, in my case. <laughs> well, I can't say that I was not a conservative because I was. I was reared that way in uh, South Dakota and by my uh, devout <coughs> parents whom uh, I admired then. I admire them even more. Uh, after all these years. They gave me a, uh, a moral underpinning that I think uh, has been the greatest strength of anything I've had to offer in uh, public life. But uh, I began to hear those liberal impulses during the Depression in South Dakota. I saw people really suffering. It wasn't because they didn't work. I saw farmers that worked from dawn until dusk who were going broke, and bankers and small business people who were working from dawn until dusk who were going broke. And we really had to do something. South Dakota voted Democratic a couple of times in those years. I think my parents voted Republican. But I began to see things happening in that state uh, that I thought were in the interest of everybody. I have to confess to you, my wife has a letter that I sent her from Italy during World War II in which I was telling her why she should vote for Dewey uh, instead of Roosevelt. So at least uh, through 1944, I guess you'd have to classify me as a conservative, uh, but those years at uh, Northwestern in graduate school studying American history turned me around. Um, we used to have an old Republican neighbor, Mrs. Truax, a very dear friend of our family. She always said that George got off the track when he went to that big college in Chicago. Uh, and uh, I suppose that's true. Uh, from uh, the perspective of, of securities, that's where I, I, I began to uh, move in a more liberal direction to which I've held more or less from that day to this. I, uh, uh, the second part of the question uh, has me saying that I still believe in American politics. 
I still think it's an honorable uh, profession, and I would encourage the best young people here to think about it as a possible career. We'll now have a question from Dr. Peter Bergeson, Chairman of the Department of Political Science. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is, how do your respective political ideologies give us a guide to a peace settlement in the Middle East, particularly uh, presently with the uh, Israeli and uh, Palestinians? Senator McGovern. Well, I've headed the uh, Middle East Policy Council. It's a nonprofit educational group for uh, the last five or six years. I used to be chairman of the Senate subcommittee on the Middle East. So I've been interested in that area for a long time. Uh, uh, I have always felt that the long-term solution to the Middle East crisis depends on a settlement of the Palestinian question first. The Palestinians have long wanted an independent entity or homeland of their own. It's difficult for me to understand why so many uh, uh, Israelis who also want an independent homeland and love their country very dearly, understandably, why they have so much difficulty understanding that impulse on the part of Palestinians. I think if there's to be a, a settlement there, there has to be a certain amount of tolerance and uh, humanity on both sides. There's no place for terrorism in uh, any of this. And there's no place for the kind of rigidity and unyielding stubbornness that we sometimes see uh, on both sides. I'm especially concerned about Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, I wish with all my heart that Shimon Perez had won the Israeli election. I, uh, <clears throat> I think, um, I think that's the view of most uh, American Jewish citizens, uh, as well as my view, because I think had that happened, the Oslo agreement could have been implemented. There would have been more concessions on territory, on boundaries, on settlements, on the future status of uh, Jerusalem. All those things are going to have to happen if there's going to be peace in the uh, Middle East. And it may very well be that our own president and secretary of state are going to have to stand a little firmer on insisting on uh, concessions on the part of all the parties if this peace process is to move ahead. No, no comment. <clears throat> the second uh, student member of our panel is Ms. Christy Johnson from Cooter, Missouri an accounting major and the student representative to the University Board of Regents. Ms. Johnson. Thank both of you for being here with us this morning. Um, Senator McGovern uh, mentioned earlier the GI, uh, the GI Bill, which allowed him to obtain an education. And I think that the need for education is evident in every mind. However, there are clear differences in the way conservatives and liberals view uh, exactly to what extent the public is responsible for educating uh, its citizens and uh, exactly how. And in that light, my question is, how important will higher education be to the 21st century? And is it the government's responsibility to ensure that each citizen has the opportunity to obtain a four-year college degree? Uh -huh. Was that yours? <clears throat> well, the answer is no. I don't think it's the government's responsibility to um, insist <clears throat> that people <clears throat> go to school. Up to a certain point, we accept that, 15, 16 years old, whatever it is. But the, even though it's statistically provable that in most cases people generate more money, about 30% more if they go to college than if they don't go to college, we still um, are a society that um, uh, honors the right <clears throat> of people to go their, their own way. The, <clears throat> the notion that, um, that uh, people necessarily ought to go to college is one of those great... Uh, wonderful, endearing American superstitions. As, as things stand right now, 25% of people, this is figures as of two years ago, who matriculate in college do not go on to sophomore year. And 50% of those who matriculate in college do not graduate. Now, this isn't necessarily because they run out of money. 
Uh, it may be because they run into academic problems that they can't handle, or it may be that they um, get married and do uh, 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 other things. Rush Limbo, as his mother was telling me a moment ago, made it only through one class uh, here. <laughs> he's, he's done all right. <laughs> Gore go Vidal uh, never went to uh, college. He does all right. It's, it's, uh, it's, we really should do away with the superstition that unless you go to college, uh, you, um, uh, you are in some, in some way contemptible. It's wonderful to go to college, and people make wonderful sacrifices to make it uh, possible, but there ought to be a suggestion that admission to uh, high sanctuaries in American life are only for those who have uh, gone to college. They should be welcomed in whatever enterprise they, they undertake. I, I agree with a considerable uh, amount of what uh, Mr. Buckley has just uh, said. I think a college education is desirable for, uh, for most young people. There are some who are probably better suited uh, to go in a different uh, direction. Um, it's my own further feeling that given the uh, crisis in our budget right now, uh, we can't afford to underwrite uh, a free four-year education for everyone. I think it's, uh, it's not in the cards right now in terms of the fiscal condition of the country. Even if it were desirable, it's not within our, our reach. Having said earlier, though, that the GIs educated after World War II, and of course there weren't nearly as many of them as there are people who might like to go to college today, uh, more than paid for their education. I think that's a strong case for strengthening the student loan program that we've now had on the statute books for many years. Instead of cutting back on that program, I think the president is right in stressing that we uh, strengthen it. Uh, those loans, in my opinion, are, are pretty good risks. It does put a burden on young people after they graduate, but that education has also given them tools that, according to all the statistics, enable them to earn more uh, and therefore to gain the capacity to retire such loans. So that's the direction in which I would go to make sure that we have a strong, guaranteed uh, loan program and make it as uh, widely available as, as practical. The next question will be posed by Ms. Ann Poston, who works in the area of human resources with the Dana Corporation. My question is regarding health care. With health care costs becoming an increasingly larger percentage of the GNP each year, what changes do you foresee in health care in the future? And what, if any, role do you see the government playing in bringing those changes about? <clears throat> Well, uh, we, we knew we had to do something about the galloping cost of, of health care, uh, a straight extrapolation of its growth during uh, the first five years of this decade would have shown it in the year uh, 2002, one is consuming 100 percent of the national product. So it, it had to begin to dip, and it has. Uh, this last uh, year, it increased by 2.2 percent, with inflation increasing by 2.3 percent. So it narrowly edged out uh, inflation. However, uh, it's caused a lot of dissatisfaction. The um, uh, health care program is, is, as somebody remarked recently, in its adolescence. There are all kinds of dissatisfactions. Doc a lot of doctors are unhappy for very interesting and good reasons. A lot of patients are, are unhappy. Uh, inevitably, inevitably, one has to go in the direction of deductibility. The, the person who is, uh, who is uh, uh, mischievously and uh, voluptuously <coughs> uh, health-minded can use up uh, an awful lot of uh, money that need not necessarily be spent. And there are, very, there are very few market enticements, or have been, to do the right thing. Somebody pointed out a year and a half ago, if you wanted a blood test in Houston, uh, you could go to eight different places and get it for prices ranging from $15 to $84. Now, 
there was zero, zero sanction to go to the $15 place rather than the $82 place under the majority of insurance policies. Something that works in the marketplace principle has got to be admitted uh, uh, into it. Remember, we're spending 13% of our gross national product on health. The, 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 the Brits, with their socialized system, are spending eight. Canadians, with their socialized system, are spending 8.2, so that we are wildly extravagant, even by the terms of state-run uh, industries. I think one of the uh, encouraging trends in American health these days is that more and more Americans are becoming health conscious and are taking the kind of preventive steps that will uh, keep them healthy. I think there needs to be more of that, more of an emphasis both in American medical practice and also on the part of all of us as individuals of doing certain common sense things that keep us from getting sick. Uh, I'm talking about watching the diet. I'm talking about uh, watching the alcohol and nicotine intake. Uh, I'm talking about exercise. Uh, Bill Buckley works as hard as anybody I know. He's one of the hardest working human beings in this country. But I notice that uh, he's always got his weight under control. He goes out and exercises uh, every day. Uh, he watches his diet with some measure of uh, common sense. Uh, and this is what all of us have to do if we want to live long, happy, uh, healthy lives. Now, beyond that, sometimes we're going to get sick, uh, no matter how much emphasis we put on prevention. I hope those prevention efforts can begin right down at the kindergarten <coughs> level with our children, where we teach prevention and common sense uh, health measures. But there are uh, probably 35 million Americans in this country who have no health insurance. And when they get sick, they're in trouble. They don't have enough income to pay the uh, uh, premiums. There are other middle-income people who are finding it increasingly hard to pay these escalating hospital and medical costs. And we have to do something about that. Uh, this may seem unrealistic given the present political climate in the country, but I still believe that comprehensive national health insurance is the way to go. Uh, we're, uh, I think it would be better for the doctors, uh, I think it would be better for the hospitals, for the nurses, and I think it would be better uh, for the patients. I would insist under any such system that people have a right to choose their own doctor and their own uh, medical uh, care. But uh, I do think that as the only industrialized country in the world that does not have a system of comprehensive uh, national health care that as we move into the 21st century, that ought to be high on the list of uh, goals for, for this country. Uh, I don't believe this managed care system is going to work very well. Um, I heard a story the other day about three people that arrived at the pearly gates at the same time. A doctor who told St. Peter he'd always ministered to the health of his patients. St. Peter said, go into eternal life and enjoy it. A nurse comes along, makes the same claim. He said, go into the pearly gates, enjoy your eternal life. The next person said, I'm the director of a managed care program. He said, go in through the pearly gates and stay for three days. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the... Uh, this is one of the problems with managed care. There's too much of the uh, bottom line uh, profit making for those who manage those systems and not enough concern about the well-being of the patient. I'm for national health insurance. We will now turn to Mr. Howard Meekle, the general manager of KFVS Television. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I'm curious as to your opinions on the campaign process uh, as it is today, and is it the best process 
uh, in your mind for going into the new millennium. It seems to have degraded to sniping rather than discussing <coughs> issues and being elected by tearing down your opponent. I wonder if uh, I would be interested in your opinions on how or what should be done to change it. Uh, Bill is deferring to me as a, as a practitioner of politics uh, one time, although he, he waged a valiant campaign for mayor of New York at one time. Uh, let me uh, say that uh, I think one of the unfortunate things that has happened to American politics was the uh, emergence of these little 30-second paid ads on television. Television is a marvelous instrument for the education and pleasure and the enlightenment of the American people. Uh, I don't know that I ever could have been elected to office in South Dakota without television uh, in essentially a Republican state. But um, I, I would have to say I'm worried about the reducing of campaign dialogue, the kind of thing that Mr. Buckley and I have been doing here today under rather relaxed and and open circumstances to little 30-second sound bites. I wouldn't worry about that so much if it weren't for the drift towards almost pure negative advertising in those ads. You can say positive things in 30 seconds about what you want to do for the public, but you can also say mean, nasty things about your opponent. And regrettably, those are the things that seem to stick uh, in people's minds. Too many cases, we've had good people in this country defeated by negative advertising. Thoughtful people who uh, were trying to serve the public interest, whose images are warped uh, and distorted by these massive uh, uh, TV campaigns, uh, largely in the 30-second and 60-second spots. If you'll pardon a personal reference, I think I was one of the victims of that type of thing uh, back in 1972. That's not the only reason I lost. Perhaps no one could have won uh, against an incumbent president as entrenched as President Nixon. But if you go back and look at the blizzard of negative campaign spots that were directed against me in that campaign with enormous sums of money, you might be puzzled as to how I got any votes. Uh, in 72. I scarcely recognize myself uh, from that uh, incessant uh, distorting uh, campaign. So I've, I've been uh, against that tactic. I don't know what you can do about it other than to encourage more of the kind of open and free-flowing uh, debate that uh, Mr. Buckley and I have been privileged to participate in here today. <clears throat> Uh, the, the answer is, of course, there's nothing you can do about it, because uh, with New York Times versus Sullivan, which is, what, uh, 32 years old, uh, you can't sue unless you can prove actual malice. And uh, in a political campaign, it's almost impossible to do so. Uh, some um, <clears throat> eight years before Senator McGovern ran uh, Goldwater, was um, paraded as the person who would intentionally and delightedly begin a nuclear war. So that uh, the, only, the only way to get any historical perspective on it is, for instance, go back a few years, study what was said in the Jefferson Adams campaign. It makes it sound absolutely a feat, uh, by contrast. Uh, in terms of reforms, uh, it is, I think, terribly important to uh, accept the postulates. The postulates are number one. We're not going to repeal the First Amendment. If we're not going to repeal the First Amendment, then people are roughly speaking free to say what they want about each other. Uh, number two, there is uh, no way in which you can, in fact, uh, repeal the right of people to spend what they want to spend to promote their ideas. Buckley versus Vallejo, named after uh, my brother, a Supreme Court decision, said that you can't repeal the First Amendment, and the First Amendment allows you to spend what you want. Uh, the, the best they could do was attempt to say, well, it can't, it, the money must be spent on behalf of ideas. 
it must not be put at the disposal of a single uh, candidate, blah, blah, blah. The answer is since 1976, when that uh, law was passed, um, uh, there has been this soaring increase. The only way to handle this is to have zero restrictions, but require instantaneous accountability. Put it all on internet within 24 hours and find out who is uh, giving uh, what and let the American people simply make uh, adjustments based on that. What we're getting now is simply phony restrictions. They don't work uh, and rising costs. I, I was certainly join uh, George McGovern happily in uh, uh, any idea of a, a board uh, an ethical board that attunes itself to flagrant uh, uh, violations of civil uh, discourse, at least attempting to ring down uh, on malefactors the kind of censor with which they should be disciplined. Our final question will come from Dr. Alberta Dugan, chairperson of the Department of History here at Southeast. Well, let's see, which of the thousands of questions that have come up this morning should I ask? But I would like to welcome you to our campus. And I guess considering the, the tone of the morning and the notion of will liberalism and conservatism last in the 21st century... Can you speak question, a little louder, please? Excuse me. My question for you is, what do you believe will be the major political issues that will be carried into the 21st century, and what part will the liberals and the conservatives play in regard to each of those issues? Uh, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that because about uh, 15 years ago uh, I found uh, myself uh, moderating uh, an exchange on what will be the big issues 20 years from now and one of the participants was the uh, futurologist, futuro no futurist, futurist, yeah, futurist of The Economist magazine who reminded the audience that uh, uh, Walter Badgett, the founder of The Economist, had decreed that uh, every 10 years The Economist should have an entire issue devoted to what were the principal predictable problems of the next 10 years. And he was uh, deputized as uh, the futurist in charge of this uh, enterprise and had spent um, uh, the month before this particular meeting going back on issues of the economists dating back to 1850, that the only thing you could say reliably about all of them is that they were all wrong. <laughs> I.e., nobody in the economists ever predicted what would be the crowning problems 10 years uh, hence. The, the problems that I've heard in my lifetime were uh, that we would all be consumed in a nuclear war, that we would run out of geographical space for people to live in, that uh, there would be massive permanent uh, unemployment. Uh, what, what in fact have been the problems? They haven't been exactly those. Uh, nobody predicted the problem of wild, wild illegitimacy uh, back in 1960. Uh, any suggestion that it was a correlation of, um, of, of poverty is absolutely uh, incorrect. The, the, uh, back when the, the, when the blacks were uh, uh, poor, before, way back before the civil rights legislation, uh, the illegitimacy rate was on the order of 4 or 5 percent. It's now 63 percent. Uh, among whites, it's risen as a percentage more from 6 to 18 percent, 300 uh, uh, percent. Now, I'd like to think that 10 years from now, that won't be a problem, but I can't persuade myself. I really think it's going to be the great problem, the disassembly of the American family. The deconstruction of, of the American family is the great problem of the future. Now, you say, what can conservatives bring to that? Uh, uh, I, I invited in my column everybody who had a view as to what ought to be done about uh, single parent families to contribute their views. And I had 450 letters. That's a lot. And I went over them very, very carefully. The answer is people don't know what to do. Uh, but they do, do believe that, uh, uh, at least the majority believe, that there ought, to be, there ought to be a mobilized sense of right and wrong in situations like this. These 17-year-old, 18-year-old boy who fathers a child without any intention of paying any attention to it uh, for the rest of that uh, child's uh, uh, life is committing a very grave offense. 
offence against the mother, against the child. And uh, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's one thing to say, uh, uh, well, we don't want to go back to the days of the Scarlet Letter. Well, no, we don't want to go back. On the other hand, let's acknowledge that the Scarlet Letter established something. People didn't want to be publicly identified as the father of a, 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 a mother of, of a child out of wedlock. Uh, newspaper estate flirts with ways to reduce divorce rate. District judge so-and-so of so-and-so Michigan believes there are too many divorces, 68 for every 100 marriages. That's going uh, <clears throat> in the wrong uh, direction, but that's one step very far removed from uh, creating uh, children without any sense of responsibility for what it is that you're doing. And, and as I say, how, to what extent is there detectable activity that however tangentially <laughs> bears on the problem, well, we're not allowed to we're not allowed to hang the Ten Commandments in a public school. Uh, some dizzy fanatic believes that that's uh, uh, more important <clears throat> than to hang the Ten Commandments and refer to them and uh, 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 point to the moral responsibilities in, implicit that were uh, uh, a part of Revelation uh, 4,000 years, 4, years ago. So I would say that, <clears throat> that, is, the <clears throat> abs that, that is the problem we have right now that's absolutely palpable. Yes, you can say uh, in the year 2012, China extrapolated will have a defensive and offensive force equal to our own. I won't be around, but those of you who are will simply have to face that problem when it comes. <clears throat> I hope it's not faced by a population that's 90% uh, 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 born to a single parent. Uh, if you want me to comment uh, briefly, uh, I think there, uh, in addition to the issues that Mr. Buckley has mentioned, I think there are uh, a few things I'd like to just quickly mention. Uh, we haven't talked much about the environment here today, but this physical universe that we've been given by Providence uh, is a very precious uh, treasure. And I think that uh, that's an issue that has to be near the top of the list of the 21st century, how we protect the waterways, the <clears throat> oceans, the forests, the land, the air, and the other things that sustain life on this uh, planet. I've already mentioned uh, the health care problem, and that has to be close to the top. I would wager that on any survey in depth, that's a concern that's still very profound with the uh, American uh, people. On the welfare uh, issue, I don't think we've resolved it simply by ending the welfare rolls. I think that uh, wherever people on those welfare rolls are either unqualified or unable to find jobs, they have to be trained. And uh, if they can't find jobs in the private sector, then we've got to come up with useful things they can do uh, in the uh, public sector. And if we're going to take these young mothers out of the home and require them to work in jobs outside of the uh, house, uh, then we've got to provide adequate uh, daycare for the uh, children. Uh, uh, at home. Uh, incidentally, if you want to make some of those young mothers uh, furious, just suggest that they're doing nothing now. Uh, it's not easy to raise a batch of little kids, uh, particularly in a miserable house, in a bad neighborhood, and with no man around. So uh, they, they're, they're already burdened. But if we want them to get out of those circumstances and work outside the home, somebody has to look after the uh, children. Uh, there's another issue that has come to my attention. I just want to mention it in passing. It's the issue of alcoholism and uh, other uh, drug addictions in this country. There are, of course, other drug addictions, but alcoholism is far and away the most widespread and the most uh, destructive. We really uh, need to do more about that problem. There's still at least in my mind, uh, more questions than there are answers. 
about why nearly 20 million Americans are addicted to alcohol. Most of us can take a drink or two uh, without any problem. But there are about 10% of Americans who can't drink at all without going all the way into blackouts and collapses and, uh, and all the rest. We need to know more about how to prevent that and how to uh, treat it. Um, one uh, comment on global security that uh, Mr. Buckley has properly identified here uh, today. I think that uh, for 40 years, the United Nations was at least quasi-paralyzed by the Cold War, the standoff between Moscow and Washington, in which they repeatedly tied up the machinery of the UN because of differing views. Now they tend to vote together in the UN, and I think for the first time we have an opportunity to beef up that organization. It might begin with us paying our dues, and uh, it uh, needs American leadership and American strength to turn it into the kind of peacekeeping and peacemaking uh, instrumentality that the founders intended. Uh, we also need to strengthen the world court. I don't want to see the United States attempt uh, to be the world's policeman all by ourselves. We have an important role to play, but we have neither the mission nor the capability to settle all these trouble spots uh, around the uh, globe. This calls for stronger and more responsible action on the part of the United Nations and the World Court. Those are issues on which I think liberalism is perhaps better positioned to take us into the 21st century than conservatism. Well, I've been asked by the chairman to um, reduce my rebuttal to just a, a sentence or two. Uh, I, I do feel obliged to make the following point about um, my hero, Ronald Reagan, uh, which is that uh, the, the, um, uh, it, it's quite true that the national debt went um, uh, haywire, uh, but it's also true that um, he reduced the deficit, the, the, he reduced the rate at which the deficit was accumulating uh, to 70% of the rate during the preceding 15 years. He also liberated during that period uh, uh, through uh, tax reductions, to be sure, reductions that had been initiated in 1978, and before that, uh, reductions that had been initiated at the promptings of not Eisenhower, not Nixon, but uh, LBJ uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 Kennedy. He teases me about being in favor of, of quoting liberals in certain circumstances. The difference between us is that I quote liberals when they do good things, and he quotes them when they do bad things. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Woodrow Wilson's uh, statement about uh, defining liberalism, the history of man's efforts to restrain the government, was written in 1881 in his book, Congressional Government, a book which he pretty much deplored when he became president of the United States uh, and started to have, find out what fun it was to tell people uh, what to do. Uh, I thank you so much for your hospitality. I thank Senator McGovern for his uh, uh, friendship. I ad admire his uh, constancy. I thank uh, the panel and the chairman. And join in the congratulations to President Nitschke. Thank you. This concludes our debate. Both Senator McGovern and Mr. Buckley uh, have an airplane to catch uh, momentarily. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed uh, the exploration with us this morning. We hope you can attend the inaugural ceremonies this afternoon at 2 o'clock in the Show Me Center. For those of you who are, pr are present who are involved with the luncheon and processional, there will be shuttle buses behind Academic Hall here, which will take you to the Recreation and Show Me Centers. Thank you very much for coming.
American Perspectives continues in a minute with columnist Suzanne Fields talking about the impact of feminism on America. Every Saturday night, American Perspectives brings you a look at the cultural and historical side of U.S. politics.